So he hello, everyone. My name is Zonko Kaiser. I'm from NVIDIA. I'm with the Cloud Native team. Uh, my current main responsibilities are working on Kata and confidential containers. And um, in this talk, I, I just want to give you also some history about sandbox environments, um, what we've done in the Kata space to enable our use cases, um, and how we can apply all those features that we added uh, to REC LLMs, but also to any AI ML pipeline. Um, agenda is talking about how we came to confidential computing, um, why we have chosen Kata as the main driver for enabling sandbox environments with the GPU. Um, a little bit explanation about our GPU enablement stack, because it's uh, important for our lift and shift strategy where we said we don't want to have any code modifications to run our GPU workloads on Kata or on confidential container. Um, we added also a virtualization reference architecture to support advanced use cases like GPU Direct, GDS, or RDMA in virtualized sandbox environments. Um, a small stop on confidential containers, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about confidential REC LLMs. Um, but let me first set the stage by why are we even doing this, right? Um, if you're looking at a container that's just a process with namespace separation and, and C group resource management, um, containers share the host kernel, meaning if I have a container breakout, it can take over the complete node, it can take over the complete cluster. Um, it's just a modern way of packaging and sharing and deploying uh, applications. It's, say, user space abstraction only. And um, the red part shows what we are most concerned about. It's the weak security boundary between the container runtime and the host operating system. We have things like SLinux and AppArmor uh, to fortify it, uh, but we don't have any hardware isolation, and we are highly dependent on, on the kernel. And uh, what we are mostly worried about is that host changes uh, may break our container stack because we are um, deploying drivers and other components that we need to enable the GPU. Um, as I said before, container escapes take over a whole node. Um, and, and we need to trust the container images um, and the manifests that we are pulling in into, into our cluster. In the past, there were some techniques that were people are looking into to create sandbox environments. Um, way back, there were unikernels. Unikernels is a way to package uh, parts of the kernel and parts of your user space into one binary without a memory protection unit. So you have fast boot times, small attack surfaces, and, and a really nice latency. But nobody wants to recompile uh, their applications and package it and uh, link uh, various um, libraries to it. It just didn't, um, was easy enough to create unikernels from existing um, applications. Um, ABM, IBM Nabla was, took this idea of unikernels and run it as a, as a process. Essentially, what they were doing is reducing, um, reducing the amount of syscalls that the container runtime is issuing to the host operating system. Um, they added hypercalls for privileged operations, and they even added a complete OCI-compatible um, runtime, so you could run containers with it and, and on Kubernetes. Um, another sandbox environment which people are aware of is GVisor. It's essentially a user space kernel implementing all syscalls um, in user space. And they, as far as I know, they re-implemented like 70% of syscalls. But GVisor has no device model, so you cannot run device drivers. You cannot run uh, easily a GPU inside of, of GVisor. Um, there's also Kubert. Kubert is a VM in a pod, and the pod is mainly used as the deployment vehicle, mostly used for legacy VM applications um, where you are in, still interacting with the VM. Um, AWS took a step and uh, created Firecracker, a micro virtual machine, uh, to run sandbox in a sandbox environment. It's a minimal operating system, but they don't have any emulation for devices, so GPU are currently not working with, with Firecracker. Um, and lastly, Kata containers. Um, this is where we invested a lot, because um, I will go 
on the reasons why and how and what we're doing in the Kata space. It's essentially also a micro and light virtual machines that we are leveraging uh, to run sandbox environments, especially GPU, uh, GPU workloads. Um, there's a nice talk on Friday by our friends in the community about running unikernels in Kubernetes. So check it out, um, especially in the, in the serverless computing in the Knative space. Okay, wh wh what's Kata? So Kata is essentially a container in, in, in a VM. Uh, Kata supports a broad spectrum of hypervisors, be it QEMU, Acorn, Cloud Hypervisor. And currently, we are working on with the upstream community on adding a Rust micro VMM, which is called Dragon Ball. Um, it seamlessly plugs into any orchestration platforms like Kubernetes and container runtimes. Um, container and workloads are now kernel and user space independent, meaning host kernel updates cannot easily break, break the stack. We can run untrusted code in a container. Uh, virtualization is a second line of defense. Um, the outer runtime is mainly responsible for life cycling of the VM. And we have an inner runtime, which is an OCI compliant um, runtime. It adheres to CNI, CSI, CRI. So it's completely transparent running a container or Kata container in Kubernetes. Um, all the functionality that Kubernetes is providing you, uh, Kata will just pick it up, be it storage, be it networking, or what the CRI is going to do you. Not only we are interested in fortifying like the isolation of the container runtime to the host operating system, but one other thing that we are really interested in is also to fortify the isolation between applications that are running on the cluster. Right. And there are several um, features or projects that are trying to enable or fortify this isolation. One is homomorphic encryption, which essentially enables computation on encrypted data without, decrypting, uh, decrypt, without decryption. We have secure multi-party computation, aka federated learning, meaning you can allow parties to jointly compute uh, a function over the inputs without uh, without revealing their inputs to other parties. Um, and the third big function that was, or features that were added uh, to hardware vendors are trusted execution environments. Um, for the past years, we have very good solutions for uh, protecting data at rest, meaning we have encrypted databases. We have good solutions of data in transit, meaning um, encryption on the network, be it IPsec or TLS. But as soon as you decrypt your database and running on a host, it's completely vulnerable because you don't have any encryption on the node. Uh, and this is where confidential computing comes into place, where those trust execution environments are providing an environment um, to run your workload in a VM, which is completely encrypted. Not only the memory is encrypted, um, the hypervisor has no access to your register state because the register state would expose like the frame pointer and stack pointer. So the hypervisor could deduce what, what you're doing in a VM. Uh, also, interrupts are obfuscated uh, so that essentially the hypervisor does not have access to any parts of the VM. So if we are breaking out of, of a container, um, we still have like VM as a second line of defense, but if a attacker also is able to escape out of the VM, he has no access to the other VMs. He can still do denial of service uh, attacks on the VM, you know, shutting them down, but the confidential data inside of the VMs is still, uh, still protected. Um, just a small history. Uh, trust execution runs is nothing completely new. Already in 2004, um, we had first trust execution environments. Uh, all the major CPU vendors uh, have trust execution environments right now. If you have a mobile phone, you're running a trust execution environment for vPay, Apple Pay, Google Pay. They're all running in some security enclaves. And all major architectures are providing uh, trust execution environments. So let me just talk a little bit why and how and what we're doing with Kata. As I mentioned before, the why, why, why we've chosen it. Containers are now kernel and user space independent. Uh, host changes do not affect us very much. Um, container breakouts cannot compromise the whole node or the complete cluster, because we are still running in a VM. Um, we can seamlessly plug in into existing orchestration platforms like Kubernetes and other container runtimes. We have full OCI runtime image support and we can run containers without modification. 
Um, the other point is we can run untrusted code in a container um, because we have virtualization as a second line of defense. And Carta supports a wide range of trusted execution environments like Intel TDX, AMD SMP, uh, ARM CCA, and uh, S390's uh, secure enclaves. Uh, we are very active in the upstream community. We are working with many companies, attending at architecture committee meetings of Carta and the confidential containers. Um, we are providing the reference architecture for. Uh, virtualized environments using accelerators. Um, we are trying to reuse um, all the parts of the cloud native stack that we have. Uh, you may heard about the talks about CDI, DRA, uh, NFD, the GPU operator. All those parts we are using in Kata and trying to integrate as much as possible because uh, eat your own dog food, right? We, we already have established a good enablement picture with the GPU on a bare metal, and we're just following uh, this path to enable it in Kata as well. Um, so we are extending the cloud native stack for any sandbox environment, be it Kubert, uh, Kata, a Firecracker, or any other sandbox environment. So what we have done in Kata, we enabled uh, GPU NIC pass-through, or in general VFIO pass-through, um, and also VFs. Um, we are extending Kata's PCI implementation to support host topology replication or side channels to provide meta information. I will talk about this a little later on the virtualization reference architecture. Um, the use case is really GPU direct RDMA and GDS in virtualized environments. Uh, enhance NFD, which is no feature discovery, to expose features to the cluster so that you can schedule um, those confidential or Kata containers on the, on the right node. Uh, we are also creating various runtimes to support all of these use cases. The nice thing is, uh, for each pod, you can define how the PCI topology is going to look like. So you can run one pod with GPU Direct RDMA. You can run the other pod with GPU Direct GDS. Or you have uh, virtual GPUs. Uh, or you have a complete GPU pass-through. So you can, by setting configurations or runtime classes on your pod YAML spec, you can decide what PCI implementation or PCI Express topology you want to run in your pod. Um, so we are also adding some new features like inter-VM communication, VTPMs, and as I said, the end goal is really to run GPU Direct RDMA GDS in, in Kata containers. So I just want to show you a brief overview of the GPU container enablement stack on bare metal and uh, what we've done uh, and how we integrated it in Kata because this is important for the lift and shift characteristics uh, that we, when we said about our premises, we don't want to do any code modification. We just want the, con the container running uh, inside of Kata, the same as we are running on bare metal. Um, stack is pretty easy. So there are features like CDI that we are using to modify the GPU container to bind uh, the needed files into the container. Um, because we need to make sure that user space and kernel space are in sync. Um, this enablement stack works with all major runtime speed, Docker, Containerd, Cryo. Um, there are other features like Cgroup v2 that we need to add a BPF program to enable devices. So all those dirty details should be really hidden uh, from the user, and it should be a seamless integration. Uh, there was just a talk about um, how to manage device drivers by one of our colleagues in the cloud native team. And the other talk is tomorrow about how the GPU operator works and how to um, lifecycle uh, GPUs in a cluster. So we have the bare metal, bare metal enablement. Uh, as I said before, GPU operator is for the Kubernetes enablement. Based also on Friday, and I'll talk about how you can use operator patterns to manage uh, hardware life cycles in a cluster. So I, I'm not going to too much into detail, but uh, the point is we are using all of our proven and working stack that's running um, for production in many years. And we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, and we want to reuse what we have. And the goal is really to run GPU containers unmodified. Uh, users should have the very same experience, no matter what the underlying uh, enablement mechanism is. So we are using it, this bare metal enablement stack and just putting it into the VM. Since the Kata agent running inside is an OCI compliant, it will support all the things that you are used, uh, that you're used to on a bare metal enablement, meaning you take your CUDA container, run it on bare metal. You can run it one-to-one -one on your Kata container or in your confidential container. Um, one thing we need to do is, of course, we need to provide all the guest operating artifacts, like the kernel, uh, firmware, 
and uh, guestfs images and configurations. But the main point is really uh, no code modification, just run it as you would on your bare metal system. And for the Kata use case, we enabled uh, GPU PF pass-through, VF pass-through, meaning all the virtualized stuff like vGPU time sliced, vGPU mic backed uh, are working. And our current use case to enable is GPU direct RDMA inside of a virtualized environment. How do you choose between those configurations? It's easy and setting a runtime class on your pod YAML. Uh, you set your runtime class vGPU or runtime class GPU kata. Uh, it's just a matter of changing the runtime class to enable any of those use cases. Let me just go a little bit about the virtualization reference architecture. Uh, what I said before, that we have a PCI topology per pod. Um, this is a brief overview of the use cases that we want to enable. There are a lot of combinations of PFs, VFs, uh, mix slices. Uh, we are adding the NIC into the mix. Uh, and the main point is the driver stack will disable peer-to-peer -peer communication if the P PCI express topology is not suitable. Uh, there are various factors like IO, MMU, ACS, ATS, PCI root pods, switch ports, all the factors that can influence peer-to-peer -peer, uh, capability. We have hardware constraints. We have NUMA, we have CPU sockets. Uh, essentially, are two modus operandi that can be reused for any virtualized environment. Um, so based on this host PCI topology, uh, we are not those are running on the both uh, on the same NUMA, so we're excluding NUMA for here now. So it's on, on one NUMA node. We have a PCI switch with a Monox and a GPU. Um, and most of the CSPs that are you providing a VM, you will get a flat hierarchy, so you don't know which GPU can talk to which uh, Melanox NIC. You lost your PCI topology uh, information. Um, usually, the VM will get a side channel, such as a file like topologies XML, uh, to set, for example, nickel peer-to-peer -peer levels. Uh, if you're running on InfiniBand or higher level libraries like UCX can read this. But there's a problem on, on lower level libraries like I, on the InfiniBand RDMA uh, libraries, UB verbs or, or GDS. They don't know nothing about that. Um, Yeah, and recently we also added uh, cold plug support uh, into Kata. Usually all the stuff is hot plugged. Uh, but how do we, let me see. Yeah, how do we provide additional in, uh, information transparently in a cloud native way, uh, which is tied, not tied to the pod, but rather to the hardware used? Um, the GPU driver stack can read a specific PCI Express virtual peer-to-peer -peer approval capability. Uh, which needs to be set by, by the user uh, to tell which Melanox NIC and which NVIDIA GPU are creating a group that are capable of doing peer-to-peer -peer or which two GPUs can do peer-to-peer -peer based on my host topology. And uh, you may heard CDI, which is the container device interface that we are using is a DSL to provide additional meta information to any container runtime. And that's what we leveraged here. So we can say, okay, this PCI Express uh, device belongs to click ID zero, and this NIC with this PCI address belongs also to click ID zero. And this is going to be picked up by the Kata runtime and built properly configure the QEMU or any other hypervisor lying around which has a PCI Express to a topology uh, implementation to enable peer-to-peer uh, -peer between uh, two devices that are capable of. The other mode that we can use is host topology replication. So we are not replicating the complete host. We are only using the main parts that we need, like the two PCI switches where we know, OK, there's a Melanix and, and a NVIDIA GPU. Uh, we can easily replicate those and create in the VM the very same architecture where it's easier for the driver stack to deduce which, co uh, which devices can talk easily together. So this is on the host, and this is then in the virtual environment the GPU driver and the NIC drivers can easily deduce the topology and enable peer-to-peer -peer far more easily uh, than having this side channel to add more meta information, as explained earlier. So of course, we have also some um, 
hypervisor limitations. I am not going to much of the detail, but this is mainly based on, on Kiyomu. Uh, you cannot attach an uh, indefinite number of GPUs and NICs to the, um, to, the, to the VM. You need to make sure that you are uh, attaching only what you need. Um, another feature that we added, if you do not care to which PCI, if it's if you don't care where your device is going to be attached, like does it need to be a PCI root port? If not, you can still attach it to the PCI Express PCI bridge, meaning you can say, okay, my GPUs are important. I need to have them on a high-speed PCI Express link. Uh, but for the Mellanox NICs, you can just attach them to the, uh, to the PCI PCA bridge if, if it's needed and the constraints on the host are, are telling you so. Um, again, with CDI, oops, with CDI we can um, tell Kata or the hypervisor how and where uh, to attach those devices so that we can enable easily peer-to-peer -peer GPU Direct RDMA or GDS. So, so we, have the, we have the confidential GPUs, we, ha we have the runtime, we, we have the virtualization. Uh, one, one piece missing is the confidential GPU. Um, they, the confidential GPU didn't happen like from one day to the other. It's a longer serve where we are adding more and more features um, to the GPU. Uh, started with firmware authentication, encrypted firmware, uh, measured boot, secure boot, uh, on die root of trust. And a um, couple of days ago, uh, we also announced the Blackwell architecture, which is the first accelerator which supports TDISP IDE. TDISP IDE is a new standard in the PCI Gen 6 standard. Um, all the encryption is done on the PCI Express bus. The attestation is done on the uh, PCI Express bus. So you get full performance with the Blackwell architecture on any, on any workloads. The H100 was using bounce buffers to exchange information between the CPU and the GPU. So if your workload has a lot of CPU to GPU communication, you may get, get some performance degradation uh, because we are limited by the capability of the CPU to encrypt data to the GPU. The GPU can, can encrypt at full line rate, so it's only the CPU to GPU communication. But with Black Belt, this is all gone. So all those features now, we have, we have the PCI topology in the VM. We have the confidential GPU. Uh, we have Kata at the runtime, which all leads us to now to confidential containers. And again, the premise that we also made for confidential containers, we don't want to do any mo code modification here as well. Um, and we're using the very same enablement stack here as well. Uh, nothing changes. We are still reusing our container enablement stack inside of it. Um, again, it's hypervisor independent. And we are supplying also the confidential parts for for the GPU artifacts here as well. Um, one important part of if you're running a confidential environment is that you want to make sure that your components are trustworthy, meaning you are expecting that your kernel that's running inside of the guest, uh, the firmware, uh, the guest image, uh, the memory are all in a specific state that you're expecting. So it's essentially what you're doing during the station, you're measuring your artifacts and comparing to some um, reference value that you're expecting. And you as a workload owner can then decide what you're going to do with this attestation report. Meaning um, one thing after you deployed um, your components, you may want to release secrets into your VM uh, and you only want to do that if you, your attestation succeeds. Um, NVIDIA and all the major um, provider of confidential are all following the REDS architecture, so it's an IETF standard. Uh, there are more things like how do you provide reference values and, uh, and other um, standards that can be read by the REDS working group, but essentially uh, the, the workflow is very same. You set up a confidential environment, you get measurements of all your components, you send it out to some remote entity which compares the measured value against the reference value, and you as a workload owner that can decide, okay, I wanna release my secrets into the VM. And with the secret in the VM, you can, for example, decrypt your storage, decrypt your encrypted container, or any other things that you, you may wanna do in, in the VM. 
Uh, yeah, this is just an overview of um, how secure key release uh, is working in confidential containers. But um, I just explained the, the, the simple version of it. Do the attestation. If at all it's OK, release your keys into the uh, confidential VM and then decrypt whatever you need. Deployment with, um, of confidential containers, again, with the GP operator. Um, on the left-hand side is the stack for the traditional container that you all know. Um, we can configure the GPU operator to deploy a confidential container with GPU pass-through, or you can configure a Kata container uh, with, let's say, GPU, uh, virtualized GPU uh, on the same cluster. So you can tell on which node you want to run, let's say, Kata, on which node you want to run a confidential container, or on which node you want to run a traditional container. This is all on top of the confidential containers operator, which, which provides us um, the CPU artifacts and the GPU operator that will provide you GPU artifacts. And as I said before, it's just a matter of changing your runtime class in a pod spec, uh, what you want to run. In the middle, it's Kata, QEMU, GPU, SMP, so it's an AMD system, or you set TDX and you run on a TDX system, or you set CCA and you're running on an ARM system. Um, it's, it's the characteristic what we want to achieve, that, what we want to achieve the lift and shift characteristics. Use your workload, change the runtime class, and decide how you want to run it. OK, now, now we have confidential environments. We have a confidential GPU. Um, what can we do with it, right? Um, rec, I took record LMS as an example. Um, and I'm listing here the potential threats. This is coming from OVESP, the top 10 threats for LLMs um, and the potential mitigation strategies that can be uh, mitigated, limited, or eliminated with confidential computing. Um, we cannot eliminate all threats with confidential computing. Um, for example, if we have model over-reliance, that's nothing we can do with confidential computing. If your model is hallucinating, we cannot do nothing with confidential computing. That's your part to do. Um, but where resources are exhausted, where breakouts are possible, like um, running insecure plugins uh, that many LLMs have, um, or denial of service things, uh, this is where virtualization or confidential compute can help you. For prompt injection, um, this is more a topic on how your API can you know, validate, sanitize, um, or check what the user is doing. Um, with confidential computing, we can limit the attack surface, or we can enable secure execution of plugins. So if we are looking at a very simple REC LLM pipeline with a front-end API server, a model server, VectorDB, the question would come up, which of those parts do you want to run uh, inside a confidential container. Um, if you remember what we talked at the beginning that I said that each container breakout can take over the complete node, I would say just run every of your containers in a confidential environment. Because if, for example, an attacker in the web front end breaks out, he has no access to anything on the, on the containers that are running the API server for man in the middle attacks or on the vector DB. Uh, VectorDB, it's an abstract representation of your trained data, but still there are some, some ways to extract confidential data. Um, and again, on, with the secure key, release, secure key release and the attestation, um, you can make sure that you only release your data sources into your VectorDB if attestation or your uh, confidential VM is in a state that you're expecting it. The same for, for the models that you're running in your model server. You want to only deploy your model, your confidential model that you are trained only to the model server if the confidential VM is in a state that you're expecting it. Some closing remarks. Um, not even 
RegLM is a special example, but, but looking at uh, all AI, ML pipelines and personas, there's always one persona who wants to protect data. There's always some stage in the AI, AI ML pipeline that you want to protect, um, which can be partially mitigated, eliminated, or, or that where confidential containers can help uh, to mitigate uh, attacks. But nothing will protect your data if you're running a random shell script from the internet or a random model inside of your confidential environment, and this thing is doing a reverse shell to some attacker and he's leaking your data. And this would be end of my session. Any questions? I thank you for your uh, presentation. I have a question. W would would it, it, it does it make sense to like uh, do that on a smaller sized uh, GPU? Like for example, the Nvidia Jetson, so like uh, smaller board boards where it's not necessarily a GPU, but it's maybe a NASIC. Uh, like on the Jetson board, I'm not sure if it's uh, same sort of GPU than the A100, for example. Um. Only the H100 and the Blackwell architecture have the hardware architecture to support confidential computing. If you have virtualization on your platform enabled, uh, you can run GPU pass through of your Jetson devices and use Kata containers. But confidential computing is only available on Hopper and Blackwell. Agreed. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. It's a more generic question. So, how about the peer to peer communication for the NV links? The GPS with NV links. Does it going to work or not? Um, I, I cannot say anything about that. Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you.